Welcome to Space News from the Electric Universe, brought to you by the Thunderbolts Project at thunderbolts.info. In the previous episode, physicist Eugene Bagashoff introduced us to potentially groundbreaking scientific research into the influence of electrical charge on the properties and behaviors of water. The link to this presentation can be found in the description box of this video. Today, Eugene offers an extensive, thought-provoking analysis on the possible vast implications for this research in our electric universe. So now let's discuss the previously described results of the paper and their potential importance. Here I'm going to put forth some hypotheses and ideas of my own, and since I'm starting from the results towards which I've advised the listener to be skeptical, at least until they would be independently verified, now I probably should advise the listener to be doubly skeptical. So when we're talking about the spectrum of water, it would be rather interesting to see how it changes across all the ranges of wavelengths, and not only the ultraviolet. Perhaps the absorption of electromagnetic waves in the visible range and maybe infrared, microwave and radio wave ranges are also affected by the charge of water. That would be very interesting to find out. Now that I've mentioned it, I would like to remember the work of Gerald Pollack, who has been a speaker at a few Thunderbolts conferences. So he has found that what he calls the EZ water, the negatively charged structured water phase that appears near hydrophilic surfaces, forms under the influence of infrared radiation. So here again we see a certain interplay between the charge of water, its intermolecular structure and the surrounding radiation. This might indicate that the suggestion of the author of the paper we're discussing now is correct. I mean the suggestion that the charge of water influences its structure, and that in its turn determines many other changes in its behavior. And at the same time it might indicate that there should be some changes in the spectrum, at least in the infrared range, depending on the charge of water. When we're talking about longer wavelengths, I must also remember the work of Pierre-Marie Robitaille, another speaker at the Thunderbolts conferences in recent years. His work indicates that what is today known as cosmic microwave background radiation might actually be emissions from the Earth's oceans, not from the universe itself. I wonder, in the light of this paper, how big of a role could electric charge of Earth's surface and electric field in the Earth's atmosphere play in this process, if Robitaille is correct? If the electric potential of Earth's oceans would influence this background radiation through changes in the spectrum of water, then the alteration of this potential, for example due to the changes in the Earth's magnetic field or due to some variations in space weather, could also change the background microwave signal. That would be a pretty strong proof that Robitaille is correct, and that would mean a certain death to the Big Bang cosmology, at least as we know it today. Then again, if the spectrum of water is tightly connected to its electric potential, that unexpectedly provides another mechanism of weather and climate modulation by space weather. Solar activity and cosmic ray flux influence both the surface to ionosphere potential difference and the vertical current density in the atmosphere, which could lead to changes in the spectral response of clouds and water vapor, thus in its turn modulating the albedo of the planet and changing the heat input from our star. It would be interesting to actually see how the behavior of water changes with height, for example, since there is a pretty strong electric field in the atmosphere, about 100 volts of potential difference per meter above the ground. So, for example, as the water vapor rises up, it should enter the areas with much more positive electric potential and technically behave like negatively charged vapor with respect to this new environment. I wonder how much of the atmospheric physics might change if that is the case, but our current models do not take that into account. Another thing that might be influenced by the changes in water properties with electric charge is seismic activity. Taking into account the overabundance of water in the mantle, at least in our current understanding of it, and for example the fact that water vapor is the primary component in volcanic eruptions. So obviously there should be an electromagnetic activity under the surface of Earth, even just because of the variations in our magnetic field or due to the interactions of magma flows with the magnetic field or because of space weather related changes in the ionospheric potential, etc. 
and this activity might alter the mechanical properties of water in the crust or underneath of it, potentially leading to sudden deformations that we perceive as earthquakes. This is another possible pathway for space weather influencing the seismic activity. Continuing the atmospheric topic, the second result is very interesting in the light of a theory by Pavel Mantashian about the formation of atmospheric structures. I've described the theory in detail at Ben and Kat Davidson's Observing the Frontier 2017 conference, and the video with my presentation is available for view on YouTube. In short, the theory states that the rotation of cyclones and anticyclones, that is, low and high pressure cells in the atmosphere, is caused by the interaction of charged particles and water molecules in the atmosphere with Earth's magnetic field. So the author of the paper we're discussing now also suggests that the rotation of the stream of charged water is caused by the same forces Montesian has suggested in his theory, namely the Lorentz force. This would explain the opposite direction of rotation of the streams of water with the opposite charge. The author also mentions that the experiments were performed in the northern hemisphere, and in the southern hemisphere the directions of rotations of streams of positively and negatively charged water should reverse because of the reverse direction of the magnetic field of the planet. Since magnetic field lines exit the surface in the southern hemisphere and enter the surface in the northern hemisphere which again is the explanation for the opposite rotation of cyclones and anticyclones in different hemispheres in Montesquieu's theory. In my opinion, such behavior of charged water is another indication that this theory is correct and the planetary magnetic field plays a crucial role in the formation of atmospheric structures and weather patterns on Earth. And not only on Earth, by the way, the same theory explains why low-pressure atmospheric cells on Jupiter and Neptune, such as the Big Red Spot, for example, rotate as high-pressure cells would rotate on Earth. It is simply because the magnetic fields of Jupiter and Neptune, and also Saturn, has opposite polarities with respect to ours. The changes in the behavior of water solutions and in the surface tension of water with its charge has obvious huge implications for various areas of manufacturing and technology, but perhaps even more importantly for biology. It is known, for example, that the cell membrane acts as an electric capacitor, having a potential difference of about 100 millivolts be between its inner and outer sides. I have to mention here that the potentials of water in experiments that the author performed were of the same order of magnitude, about 500 millivolts. So if the properties of water itself in the cell and in between different cells change because of this electric potential, this opens up a completely different perspective on the role of this membrane potential. Potentially this is a very fruitful area for new discoveries. Maybe it is even one of the keys to understand life itself. Just as an example, recently a group of researchers claimed to have discovered a new organ in the human body called interstitium, basically a network of protein filaments that most likely connects all the parts of the body. Maybe this organ is actually responsible, for example, for the transfer of electrical signals between different tissues, which cause changes in water behavior and their according chemical processes, and so on. It might even be responsible for the proper differentiation of new cells. We've discussed this idea at one of the recent 9 VC podcasts with Todd Kleckner, Neil Thompson and Trevor Toller, which is also available on YouTube. The epigenetic role of bioelectricity has recently been studied already, though the exact mechanisms how it might work still remain unclear. At least this paper we're discussing now provides one possible option for this. It is the water itself that is affected by these electric signals. I was also intrigued by the influence of the charge of water on the hydration of polymers reported in the paper. Could it be possible to enhance crop yields just by using charged water, for example? Or if we suppose that it's the potential difference that matters, we might continue to use just regular water but apply a small negative potential to the plant itself, which would lead to a faster growth. This is a very fascinating area for new research. So among other things, the author describes findings regarding the freezing temperature of water. 
and I became curious, what about the boiling temperature? As I understand it, the boiling temperature should depend on surface tension. Basically, boiling is a process when the liquid is no longer able to suppress the vapor bubbles from forming inside of the volume of the liquid, which is otherwise counteracted by surface tension. And since the changes in surface tension with different electric charge are also reported, then in my opinion it means that the boiling temperature of charged water should also change. So I would expect the boiling temperature of positively charged water to be higher than in case of negatively charged water, since the author states that the positively charged water has higher surface tension. Although one should note that surface tension itself also depends on temperature, and I am not sure that the character of this dependence would be the same for both negatively and positively charged water, and if there are significant differences, it might potentially alter the result that I am suggesting. Now I'm going to go a bit further and ask a question, is this only a property of water that we're talking about or is it characteristic of all substances? Of course water is in many regards unique, but it would be very interesting to see if the characteristics of other substances would also change with their charge. If spectra, surface tension, freezing and maybe boiling points of other substances change with their charge as well, just imagine what consequences that would have for physics and chemistry. It's like a whole new dimension added to all the known processes with quite staggering potential possibilities. Just an obvious example, we would need a whole new set of phase diagrams for substances that would take into account not only the parameters of pressure, volume and temperature, but also the electric charge or electric potential. We would already need that for water if the author is correct, but if it applies to other substances as well, and in general in my opinion it should, then it's really a shocking revelation. And well, since this is a space news episode, now let's talk about space a little bit. It is quite obvious that the models that are used nowadays for studying other celestial bodies do not take into account the possible alteration of properties of substances under the influence of their electric charge. This is just beyond the scope of basically all the theories they are based upon. But if this paper that we're talking about is correct, and at least the properties of water change quite dramatically depending on its electromagnetic environment, then it basically nullifies many of the statements that people make about the behavior of water on Mars, or on asteroids and comets, or in the clouds of Venus, or even worse, in the interstellar medium or some other galaxy. We don't know what its spectrum should like, we don't know what its surface tension should be, we don't know when it would freeze or boil, we don't know how the solutions would behave and so on, simply because we don't know the properties of its electromagnetic environment. So the reverse operation of determining the parameters of the environment through the observed properties of water would also be incorrect, if again the electromagnetic factor is not taken into account. And once again, I would mention that if it applies to other substances as well, the situation with our ignorance only gets orders of magnitude worse. Just as an example, I would like to return to the works of already mentioned Dr. Robitaille. He is stating that the sun might not be a ball of gaseous plasma, but rather a ball of liquid metallic hydrogen. So in the light of what I said earlier, we might suppose that, for example, the electric charging of hydrogen modifies its phase diagram in such a way that the transition to liquid metallic state becomes favorable, thus helping a star to form and sustain itself in more or less stable state. Now there is also a general concern that I have regarding this whole research and its possible implications. In his work, the author used a control sample of, quote, uncharged, quote, water that was stored in some container, and he measured the potential of the water charged positively or negatively with respect to this control sample. And here quite naturally rises an important question, but what is the true charge and potential of this water? In physics, the situation with electric potential is pretty clear. It is a relative quantity, in the sense that there is no absolute zero of electric potential, so to speak. And the electric potential itself does not play any role. What matters is only the difference in potentials in different points. That is what creates an electric field that acts on charged particles. So one can basically arbitrarily set the potential at any point as zero. 
So what I'm trying to figure out with this is basically what really determined the change in the behavior of the water in these experiments. I mean, this uncharged water, as it was in constant contact with objects placed on the surface of the planet, should have had the same negative potential just like the ground itself had, with respect to the upper atmospheric layers anyway. So why was the change in properties only observed when the water deviated from this potential? Basically I'm asking here, was the uncharged water really uncharged if the surface of the earth is charged negatively? And if it was charged, then with respect to what? Where is the true zero of water, so to speak? To be honest, I don't have clear answers to these questions. Again, the physics states that the electric potential is a relative quantity, but to me it almost seems like these experiments defy that statement. Maybe it's actually the potential difference between the water and the objects in contact with it is what caused the observed results. In my opinion, this seems to be the easiest way to explain it, at least it's the best explanation I have at this moment. For example, the surface tension of water changes during the interaction with the glass of the petri dish or the air in the room at different electric potential. Or the freezing temperature of water changes during the interaction with the surface at different electric potential. The same is with solutions and polymers. There was also a potential difference between them and the charged water they've interacted with. The most difficult part here, probably, is to explain the changes in UV absorption spectra. It seems like indeed the whole volume of water somehow structurally transformed. Maybe because of the interaction of the charged water with the container that was at different electric potential. So in my opinion it might be the case that not the charge itself, but the charge relative to the immediate environment is what causes these changes. And now returning to a bigger picture. I believe this is one of the main overarching ideas in this community, that space is not electrically neutral, and without a proper understanding and taking into account of the electromagnetic effects in space, we are left in the dark. A slight pun intended here, as the light itself is an electromagnetic phenomenon. Christian Birkeland explicitly stated more than a century ago that space should be filled with electric currents, charged particles and magnetism. Only half a century later it became clear for everyone that he was right. But still it is not considered to be a major factor in the behavior of astrophysical objects and sometimes just outright ignored. But this paper that we talked about here shows an interesting twist where the same electrical neutrality, if mistakenly assumed for even bodies on Earth, might lead to wrong conclusions, missing the important changes that potential differences impose on regular substances that are right under our nose and even make up most of our own bodies. It's really good and inspiring that we can study this behavior in much more detail here on Earth, which hopefully would lead us to an adequate recognition of the same processes in space. So even on Earth, where we have the supposedly electrically neutral ground, things might go unexpected ways when the potential difference is introduced. But in space, everything is even worse. Returning to what I've said earlier about the relativity of electric potentials, I wish to repeat a motto that I've been proposing for the EU community for a couple of years now. I quote, there is no ground in space, end of quote. Meaning that in the most general case, there would always be potential differences between different bodies, and we cannot just ignore them, and they have to be important and influence the behavior of these bodies in a major way. And to conclude this discussion, I wish to mention the words of another frequent EU contributor, Michael Claridge, who said to me in response to my motto that it is a logical continuation of Copernicus' line of reasoning. We used to believe that the Earth is the center of the universe around which everything was revolving. The heliocentric model showed that this is not the case, and later developments have shown that even the Sun is not the center, but just a regular star like trillions of billions of others, and the universe probably doesn't even have a center around which everything would revolve. But that is a Copernican principle in gravitational terms. And Michael noted that the same should be done in electromagnetic terms. We should abandon the geocentric, so to speak, idea that we have some zero potential ground somewhere. 
There is no absolute zero of potential in the universe to which everything is connected and thus becomes electrically neutral. Rather, each body has a potential of its own, which is, in general, different from other bodies. And thus, the universe is constantly sparkling with electric activity, and I'm glad that we are here to appreciate it.